Hey everybody, it's Colin McEwen from the New Fly Fisher and uh, really sorry that we're late coming online. We upgraded uh, our stream yard today to HD and it would seem we've got some technical problems. Uh, Facebook and YouTube both disappeared for some reason. We don't know what happened, but there's Mark and we're online. He just hung up on me. We've been going back and forth on our cell phones going, what's going on? What's going on? And we we're online earlier. I actually loaded up everything here for video and stuff, but you know the bottom line? We're going to try this again. And I'm going to take a look here. And, oh, video clips are here. It's all this. Mark? Is the technology can... fantastic? Uh, I can barely hear you, Mark. Your audio is not there. Is it, isn't technology fantastic? I know. And I took my headphones and ripped them off and threw them across the room. I was so cheesed off. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. We got our first person saying hi, Nick. Okay, thank you. Hi, Nick. Just let us know we're out there. On. Uh, hey, hey, Manuel. All right, roll the animation, Colin. Roll it, baby. Oh, man. <laughs> what a start to the evening. I got to tell you. Got to tell you. Uh, let me find it. There it is. Okay. I will catch these all day. That is what you're in for on this episode. <laughs> I can tell you, I haven't even started drinking this stuff. And now I want to. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You know what? That's, that's what the way it goes. And, you know, where everybody expects you to plug in a computer and everything be perfect. But uh, oftentimes it just doesn't happen that way. And, and, and you know what, it's the same on the river. Right? There's so many times where you get, you know, your line wrapped around a reel and, and all that kind of good stuff. And it just turns into a giant shit show. So welcome to the shit show, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. And hello to Japan. That's cool to see somebody from Japan on here. Um, that's, that's listen, fantastic. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we really apologize for being late. Uh, it's pretty exciting tonight. Uh, what we thought we would do, we've got a whole bunch of guests coming over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas. But what we thought would be really great is to have a little peek sneak at what's coming up. And it's all starting December 26th, day after Christmas Day. And the plan is uh, we'll go live on YouTube that day with the start of the season. I think our first show is uh, you and Tom Rosenbauer in the Bahamas, but uh, we'll get into that in a second. But the key is we've got some great guests coming over the next few weeks. Tom Rosenbauer, we've got Phil Rowley, uh, who's just about to launch a new book. Uh, I've got um, John Garrich, who's got a new book as well coming out, or just came out, excuse me, in the spring. And Marshall uh, McCluchin, McCluchin uh, from uh, Midcurrent's gonna come on. So, and we've got some others that we haven't even uh, confirmed up to date. So between now and Christmas, we've got lots more of these coming on Wednesday nights. And we might even be able to start right on time at 7 o'clock if we can just get our uh, SHIT together. But anyways, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Mark, why don't you go ahead and start this? I yeah, know. you know, we've, we've, we've been very fortunate um, this year uh, to be able to continue to do what we do. And, uh, and travel around North America and the Caribbean uh, to be able to deliver destinations, content, tips, tricks, and fantastic fish to our, our loyal viewers. Um, just as an aside, before we get into it, I wanna thank everybody. We're over 101,000 subscribers on YouTube. That's for a fly fishing niche sport. That's absolutely fantastic. And you know what, we owe a lot of that. Well, we don't owe it all to you to you guys and, and, uh, and the people that are learning to fly fish, that wanna learn to fly fish and our seasoned experts. So uh, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much. You make what we do a lot of fun and uh, it's it's just a fantastic thing. Now we've been we've been um, uh, hampered this year by, uh, by uh, a thing called COVID-19. That's a and, funny word uh, you use there, Mark. <laughs> hampered. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 been an interesting year, and uh, it's been an interesting year of jumping through hoops and and being able to continue to deliver the product that we do to help our uh, our our friends in in the industry to make sure that they're able to continue um, uh, to ha have people in to do all kinds of to do all kinds of fly fishing activities. Um, 
you know, it's it's been it's been an interesting year, but we've managed to plow through it. And I'm pleased to say that starting in December, uh, late December, we will have 27 episodes of the new Fly Fisher coming to you on YouTube, on Sportsman Channel Canada, and on World Fishing Network. So it's been a good season. Now that we can say so, right? <laughs> It's been, I've been making this show, Mark, 20 years, and I can honestly say I thought I'd seen a lot, and this year just, it won all the awards for being special. Yeah. And, yeah, and 2020 and is a special year. It, it is a special year, and we, we, let's not get into it, because everybody here knows uh, what's going on, uh, but let's just say we had a lot of challenges, but when we got to go to the locations and destinations to fish and make the shows... They were fantastic. I mean, we hit them out of the park. And, and I'll give you perspective, everyone. A lot of the lodges that uh, I know I went to in Labrador, they weren't even open to the public. So I was going into lodges where there was nobody there. Fish hadn't seen a fly. It was a little surreal. A little surreal. It's just me and the black flies and the guide. And the cameraman, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Anyways, so... Mark, why don't you first talk about the first uh, the first show, which actually we shot you shot this a while ago for this season. Absolutely, yeah, we, we shot this show um, uh, out of the Bahamas, out of uh, um, Andros Island, this in December. And if anybody's looking to 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 target, and I believe the Bahamas are slowly opening up now, but if anybody's looking to target world class. Uh, fantastic bonefish, tarpon, permit uh, angling. The Bahamas really has it, has you covered. You know, from from where I live in Toronto, I can land in Nassau in three hours. I can be fishing in four and a half hours from my house, which I think is fantastic. So what we did, we we worked with Bahamas uh, Tourism, Peter Douglas and Taran Sims, who have become great friends. Uh, of ours. Um, and we decided that we were going to take things a little bit differently this year and go on a tour of Andros Island. So Andros is a giant island. It's the most uninhabited island on in, in, the, in the 700 islands of the Bahamas, um, of the main islands. And, uh, you know, based on the time of year and the bonefish migration, you can really light it up. Tom Rosenbauer from uh, the Orvis Company and I went down to shoot an episode of the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing as well as the new Fly Fisher, and we absolutely lit it up. I caught three bonefish um, over nine pounds and one in the double digits. So it was an absolutely amazing fishery. We hit it just before the spawn, just before those, just as those fish were looking to travel from the west, the east coast to the west coast, and you could literally park it in a spot and have waves of bonefish come to you. So it was, it was one of the best bone fishing experiences I've ever had. And it was just, uh, I mean, to, cap, to be able to release, you know, five, seven, 12, 15 bonefish in a day, I mean, it gives you a workout for sure. So, Mark, uh, I think we have a video clip from the show. Let me just pull it up here, which I'm sure everyone would like to see, especially if you're like me and it's getting a little cold here right now. And I'm kind of wishing I was in the Bahamas. Uh, I know the guys out west are in the United States and Canada are certainly feeling this cold. So here's a clip. Uh, what lodge are you at in this? Do you remember, Mark? So, yeah, so coming out of this lodge, we were out of um, uh, Swain's Key Lodge. Uh, no, actually, we're out of the, out of um, Andros Island Bonefish Club. I was fishing with uh, David Newbold, who is a fantastic guide, a full-time guide, multi-generational guide there. And he wanted to do something different on this trip. He wanted to go into deep water and fish bonefish in in depths that are more than three, four, and five feet. Cool. So again, we're hunting big fish on Andrews Island. And we're fishing basically about maybe three and a half, four feet of water. And when you're fishing in a depth of three and a half, four feet of water, you want to go to a bigger fly with leaded eyes, preferably a number two fly with a leaded eye, so that the, the fly is able to sink right down to the fish. So when you're fishing big fish in deep water, you, want it, you don't want to be casting like small fish in the shallows where you're pushing across them and stripping, stripping, no. When you're fishing big fish in deep water, you're sharp shooting. So first of all, you go straight at the fish, 
with a lead eye fly, four or five feet of water or more, and let it sink without stripping. The fish will see the fly when it's sinking, you'll attack it and you make that giant long strip. And that's how you fish big fish in deep water. Keep stripping, stop, long strip, got him. It's not a huge fish, but it's not huge, but it's a fish. He's a solo. Yeah. Well, just after lunch, we switched over, switched boats. Tom's fishing with a glister and I'm back with David. And uh, we came almost to the west side of Andros from the club and man, oh man, we're locked horns with a good one. We're seeing, I'm out of breath. We're seeing these waves of bonefish coming down this flat. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And this was a group of four. And this was the lead fish that came and ate it. And it's a good fish, man. Woo hoo. Oh yeah. I've got my drag cranked right down and he's taken me into the backing twice. And it looks like he just might try to do it again. High rod tip, fight him off the rod until he decides to turn tail and come right back. There we go, the whole fly line, there it goes. Third time. Nice fish. Now, we came on this side because we decided we were gonna hunt for giants. And David, I hate to tell you this, but you lied to me. <laughs> you said that this was a patience game. <laughs> and you said... For me. For, <laughs> for you. And you said that, you know, we're gonna get shots, a few shots at big fish. Well, we've been here for probably a half an hour. <clears throat> and this is a big one. I'm not sure it's a double digit, but it's a good one. By the way it's acting, it feels good, it feels great. You do get chances at big fish on this side, don't you, David? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're just watching the tide. All about the tides. It's all about the tides. But these are big open flats, a lot of foods, a lot of crabs, a lot of shrimp. I see these big fish oh, like these big open fish. Bank. It's a nice fish. Anytime a fish is taking you three times in the back and definitely is over six, seven pounds. Yeah. And more. Now what I love about this is that you can see these fish from far enough away that you can place your cast and you can watch them eat. And when these bonefish eat, they drop their nose and their pecs flare out. And that's, oh my gosh, it's big. And that's when you know to do that strip set and let the dance begin. Nice fish. It's a nice fish. That's Seven, eight pounds, don't you yeah. think? Yeah, eight pounds. So you want to come to Andros Island to catch trophies? They are possible. And bonefish pushing double digits. How do you like that? Absolutely fantastically spectacular. Big, there we go. How do you like that? That, my friend is absolutely incredible. Thank you. Bonefish slime for everyone. And write that down, Mark. Absolutely fantastically spectacular. I mean, here's that. It just comes off my tongue, man. I gotta tell you, I don't know how you did it and had that roll so naturally, because I like to use that for a big brook trout. <laughs> So that uh, so that fish actually, in in hindsight, you know, when when we were when we were taping that show, uh, we didn't realize how big that was until until the cameras were shut off, and that that actually was a ten or eleven pound bone, um, and you know, to get a fish that pulls you into your backing from the boat three times in a row is is a giant, and uh, that that was the biggest bone fish I've ever I've ever had the pleasure of releasing, and uh, I look forward to going back to. Uh, um, uh, Andros Island Bonefish Club and, and 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 besting that because they get them up to 14, 15 pounds there. Wow. Now it's important to note that uh, two things about the show. One is that when you went there, you didn't go to just one lodge. You were set up to go to four different lodges on Andros Island, correct me if I'm wrong. And then the other thing that's really important for everyone that's uh, here with us right now and in the future watching this is that 
unlike the TV broadcast, which is 24 minutes, this show has got to be 40 minutes or more. I mean, that's the beauty of YouTube. We no longer have the restrictions of a half hour. So if you've got a great story to tell of going to four lodges and talking about Andrews Island, it's big, it's full, it's beautiful. It's got the information on their tackle, the flies. I mean, all this stuff, way more than we could put in there before. Why don't you talk about that, Mark? Because I think people need to hear about the level of, I mean, we started this last year, but this year, like we've got shows that are going to be almost an hour or some are, I think, just over an hour. Absolutely. And, and, and the interesting thing about, about what we're doing is, you know, our broadcasts for, for television are fantastic. They're great. They're 23 minutes long, but what we're able to do on a platform such as YouTube is we're able to tell the story in its entirety. So when we were down in Andros, um, you know, we hit four different lodges. We hit Eva's Bonefish Lodge, which sleeps six people. It's a small, intimate um, uh, bonefish lodge run by a lovely older lady named Eva. She's a gourmet chef. You're right on the beach. You can cast from your, from your basically from the door of the, of the resort. Uh, it's wonderful. You know, then we went on to a Small Hope Bay Lodge, which is wonderful for families because you've got the third largest Great Barrier Reef in the world there if you like to snorkel or dive. Our camera guy, Ryan Pizzacala, um, got to swim with turtles. He got to swim with dolphins. He got to swim with giant manta rays. Uh, he got to catch his own his first bonefish on a wading flat by himself. Um, and it, it, it's just, it's, it's a great spot for families that, that want to have the recreation, but, you know, also want to be able to go out and participate in, in a fantastic fishery. We then moved on to Andros Island Bonefish Club, which is sort of on the, uh, on the other side of the island and has access to the west side, which is where those big fish are. The west side relates to deep water. They're coming out of the deep water to do their thing to feed all that stuff. And those are where, that's where that big fish came from. That's where, the, that's where they are. Um, and then the final spot we were at was at Swain's Key Lodge, which is just off of Andros on Mangrove Key and a short boat ride from, from, the, from the island. And we were able to walk and wade as well as fish from a boat for, for big bone fish. Uh, Cheryl Bastian runs um, Swain's Key Lodge and it is just absolutely perfect for those people who are interested in getting uh in getting in, into their first bonefish and have a shot at, at a legitimate double digit fish i think she released a couple over 13 pounds last year wow so that's a that's a pretty fantastic fishery in my book yeah my biggest one's like five six pounds so that i can't imagine a, a 12 pound bonefish on an eight weight rod and oh yes you can oh yes you can <laughs> <laughs> it's good to fantasize especially yeah. on a cold night like tonight when I was out chipping ice off my truck for <laughs> I came back home. So um, why don't we change? Uh, Cause we got a lot of different places to talk about and different mm -hmm. things. But before we go, what was the equipment you were using? Yeah, so good question. Um, what you need for bonefish is floating lines. Uh, you need long leaders. Uh, we were using 12 foot, uh, 13 to 16 pound leaders. Um, and as you're, as you're cutting back your tippet, you're at, you're adding tippet to it in, in the, you know, the two X range. Um, and then, uh, you know, at eight foot, nine weight, eight foot, eight weight fly rod. Uh, and the most important thing with bonefish, the, literally the most important thing, if you take anything away from this is to bring a large arbor reel with a sealed drag. And the reason why I say that is because you're in the salt water. You don't want to spend, have to spend time taking your reels apart and washing them, getting rid of the salt um, every night. You want to go back, have a frosty adult beverage, eat some conch fritters, um, you know, eat, eat lobster for dinner. You don't want to be wasting your time on your equipment. But number two is those bonefish, as you saw with that big 10 pounder, they'll run you. I mean, fly lines 100 yards and they will run you another 200 yards into your back. And if, if, if you don't have them cranked down, so they are they are literally the the pound for pound for their size they're just they're badass really are and they and they will do some damage to your to your fly gear if you're not well gunned so mark this is a good segue talking about the importance of a quality drag um for the next destination which is labrador atlantic mm -hmm. salmon because like bonefish you can't have uh, a cheap reel to land big bone or big uh, atlantic salmon <coughs> sorry so the place I want to talk about 
in Labrador is Big River Camp. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I should preface this by telling people that would not know this outside of Canada, the Maritimes, which is Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, and Newfoundland Labrador, they were actually in a what they called a bubble. And it was closed to people from the rest of Canada and, of course, from the world from going into for the entire summer. So we were very fortunate. The people in Newfoundland Tourism um, helped us. We got an exemption. And uh, the adventure I had with the cameraman, though, was that as part of the agreement, we couldn't fly there. I had to drive from where I live here in Ottawa all the way to Goose Bay and Labrador non-stop because they didn't want us to stop anywhere and it took us 25 hours to drive straight and we're going through some pretty rough terrain on some of those uh, old old roads um, through Quebec and into Labrador but we got there we flew into the lodges and I was there for just over a month with a cameraman and we flew right out to a lodge that day so we were pretty toasted the first 24 hours, but once we got in there, got uh, squared off, uh, everything was good. So why don't I play for everybody uh, a little scene from Big River Camp, one of the places I went to. I'm going to do two from Labrador. Um, I was I wanted to put in uh, another location for Brook Trout, but unfortunately I uh, didn't get time today. But we'll do another one in the future here, Mark, about the Brook Trout fishing that I experienced. I'll just say this. It was like a fantasy in many ways. It was a long month. I mean, we were working, and I know people that are watching this are going, no, you weren't, you're fishing. Uh, so actually, I'll work. But uh, we can explain that in another uh, chat. But let me play this video, which kind of says everything about Big River. And I want to preface it by telling you that this isn't actually the river. This is a small stream running into Big River in Labrador. It's down in southern Labrador. and we were there to catch brook trout because there's brook trout in the stream. But I guess there's also some salmon. So watch this.
How come you've never shown that? To Very me cool. Before? So, <laughs> so something everybody needs to know is I was there to catch brook trout. I actually had a six weight rod and that was a 10 pound Atlantic salmon that had just come up. It had sea lice on it still, fresh chrome. It was not where it was supposed to be. And I threw a bomber because I was just trying to get the brook trout to come up and snap at it or grab it. And there's brook trout in there, five, six pounds, but a lot of two, three pounders. And camera was all set to get the slow-mo and got an Atlantic salmon. So when I did the big woo-hoo, I didn't think I was going to land him. That was 4X tippet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great choice of music, too, because that was a waking fantasy. Absolutely. I'd never seen that fish before. What a that, that's that's a fantastic catch. That's absent. Now, I have to tell you, I love Atlantic salmon fishing, and Colin and I actually fought this spring over who was going to be able to do the the maritime shows and because of the, the the bubble the atlantic bubble i had to i had to back down and say okay if you're going to do it you go and you do them all because we don't we didn't want to have to quarantine and stuff like that once we got back so congratulations colin what a fantastic fantastic fish if anybody's thinking of fishing atlantic salmon don't do it i swear don't do it because it is all you will think about when you close your eyes that's what you're going to see it is so addictive so much fun and uh yeah you can diy you can go to a lodge it's it's just it's heaven well i don't feel too bad for you mark because the <laughs> trade was <laughs> i may have gone to labrador for a month but who went to idaho for what three weeks yeah wyoming wyoming montana montana yeah 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 you you kind of suffered there my friend so um, that's a good segue. Uh, I'm going to come back to Labrador because I want to show something else from uh, Labrador, another place that I hadn't been in almost 15 years. But why don't we talk about one of the places I have not been, I want to go so badly, but you've been now two years in a row, and that's Yellowstone Teton Territory, that whole region up there that looks absolutely phenomenal just from – a landscape perspective. It reminds me a lot of Chile where you get, you know, such varied terrain, beautiful rivers, cutthroat that are unbelievable, hopper eats, nymphine, streamers. Tell, let's talk about the places you went there. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, Idaho and Yellowstone Teton territory are, um, they're, it's the locations that, that trout fishing dreams are made. There is a highway that runs from Island Park down to um, Idaho Falls, and that's Highway 20. And Highway 20 is the artery of access for trout anglers in the state. And you can fish legendary rivers like the Henry's Fork of the Snake, the South Fork of the Snake River, Teton River. Um, you can go up into the into the park and fish the Madison. Um, it, it is the perfect place to drive and and to go exploring and go and go catch trout. To let you know what what the landscape's like. You've got mountains on your periphery that go into foothills where there's cattle grazing. Uh, you've got canyons that are thousands of feet deep. Um, you've got uh, grizzly bears, not going to mince words. You've got grizzly bears and rattlesnakes, and you've got all kinds of things that make your hair stand up on the back of your neck. But what else you have is giant, giant fish. And just this spring or the summer um, out of the Snake River, they released – uh, a new state record cutthroat, um, which was a catch and release record that taped out at, uh, I believe, 15 pounds, 32 and a half inches for a cutthroat, a purebred in a river. cutthroat in a wow. river caught on a nymph. Wow. That's a big trout. And then there was another one caught just after that, that was a half an inch, and excuse my recollection, it was either half an inch smaller or, or bigger that tied that record. So giants are there, and it's just phenomenal. And that Highway 20, if I remember, it's got a nickname. Don't they call it the, the Trout Highway? Yeah, the uh, something like that. The uh, it's like a fantasy. or something. It's like like that. That. <laughs> fantasy, the whole thing. And that region you're in is just phenomenal because there's so many places. You can spend two days at this place and three days at that. Like you could plan a whole holiday, two-week holiday and hit a whole bunch of different destinations and they all have different accesses, different rivers and places, right? And that's the beauty of it. If you want to do a walk and wade in, in Idaho, you can do that. You can go and do it yourself on the Teton River 
and actually walk in and fish. Whereas in many, many Western states, you're not allowed to, to touch the bottom. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but the cool thing about Idaho, about that, that swath on highway 20 is you can fish giant rivers like the South Fork of the snake. Right. And you can do something that's totally small, totally intimate uh, with a three weight rod dancing with big brown trout, big rainbows, cut bows and hybrid or cut bows and, and purebred cutthroat trout. So uh, before I roll a video here that you can tell me which one you want, but um, this weekend, this is a good chance for us to talk about it. This weekend, we have a very special video that we shot this past year. Uh, at Three Rivers Ranch in Yellowstone Teton territory. And right. quite, this is, I want people to know, it, it premieres this Saturday on YouTube. Uh, it's gonna be on uh, World Fishing Network as well and Sportsman Channel Canada. But this is again, one of those big videos, big story videos, and especially because this one is a compelling story about Lonnie and Doug who owned Three River Rodge, or Lonnie owns it, but uh, Doug's the head guide there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what's coming this Saturday at 9, 9 a.m. on uh, Eastern time. Yeah, so um, Colin and I were in Missoula, Montana two years ago uh, in, in 2019, and we were able to be on hand when Lonnie Allen, who owns Three Rivers Ranch, um, was awarded the most prestigious award that Orvis gives, and that's the Lifetime Achievement Award. And Colin nudged me and said, you got to go meet that lady because she's she's wonderful. She's got a fantastic story. But the best part about her, Lonnie, is her head guide, who's now 85 years old, 83 years old. His name's Doug, Doug Gibson. He's a professional fly tire. Uh, and he's been there for 45 years. He's been there. He's basically watched Lonnie grow up. When he was six, when Doug was 16 years old, Lonnie's grandfather would sneak him beers at at the uh, at the uh, Warm River Inn that he used to own. So what we were able to do, and Lonnie, bless her heart, gave us the um, uh, no holds barred access to her and Doug. And she opened her heart. She opened her emotions. She opened up their relationship. She talked about her father. It, if anybody's seen the TV show that Colin and I did called Guided, it's it's a biographical look at how, how they got to where they are today and what the relationship is. And in a time like this, when everything's kind of going to batshit, it's a great story to warm your heart and to, uh, to have faith back in humanity. And to realize that fly fishing does really span all ages and everything. It's it's just, it's it's a feather in my production cap. I'm super proud of it. Um, when Doug called me and after he saw it and said, thank you, uh, we were both in tears. It was just wonderful. Well, so it's this Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. The show will premiere on our YouTube channel. So what video from the many places you had to suffer this summer in Yellowstone Teton territory, would you like me to put up there, Mark? Would you do you want me to put up the Teton one that we talked with uh, uh, last week with, or would you like me to put up one of the other ones? Let's show that Teton one. That Teton one is is one of the most unique, the more unique techniques that I've ever had the experience to do. And it, uh, I'd never seen it done like this before. And it was 100% fun to fish this way. And you can catch, you can hunt giants. Now are we talking about the one where he's cutting the fly or are you talking about the flat water in the boat with the flat, flat, water. flat water? Okay, that's my favorite too. Everyone, <laughs> enjoy. Ah, trip, trip, trip. Ah. That's a big fish, man. Nice. We've watched this fish from yards up. That's a beauty. Feeding and getting happy. That's a beauty. Trophy cutthroat on the Teton River. Look at that. Oh, big fish, man. Oh, man, look at this one. There we go. Big wild cutthroat. Great job, Mark. Great job. So the crazy part about that fishery is you're in what is called a coffin box. And it's literally a square, it's a rectangular boat. And you float at the same speed as the current. Uh, the guide has got poles and is pulling you down and you're headhunting. 
So you're looking for feeding fish and you're, we were fishing uh, green drakes uh, with a nymph, uh, with a, a merger dropper. And you try to put that fly within a foot of where that fish last ate and ha hang on for a ride. And I'll tell you what, it was one of the most fun, fun ways to fish. And, uh, you know, based out of Teton Valley Lodge, Chris Scott was the guide and he's dialed in. Um, he does some stuff that's absolutely crazy. So it, it was totally unique and it's kind of stuff that gives you goosebumps. Well, I got to tell you, I was really impressed. And, uh, you know, when you watch a video and you see a type of fishing and it gets you really juiced, that challenging sneaking up in a pole, keeping down low, making sure the fish don't see you, making that long cast, that looked pretty epic to me. It's, it was. It's all what I wanted to do all week. He's like, what do you want to do? And I said, let's go, let's go back out of your doorstep and, and do that, uh, that hunting again. And he's like, well, why don't we go over to the Teton River and float the canyon and catch trophy, <laughs> trophy cutthroat in small creeks? Okay, let's do that. Oh my gosh. Just if, if you want to, if you want unspoiled fisheries with giant fish, ample opportunities, you can't fish Idaho in a lifetime uh, and there's nobody there. So let's, uh, Let's now that we've looked at that video, I want to go back to a place I really love, Labrador, and uh, talk about a place that I haven't been in almost 15 years. Way back when I first started the show, it was one of the first places I, I went to. Uh, at that time, Jim Burton owned the lodge, and I'm talking about Flowers River Lodge. It's one of the most northern scheduled salmon rivers in Labrador. Uh, a lot of people know the Eagle River and places like that, but this one. It's kind of special. I mean, when we're there, uh, and I was there middle of July is when we got there, and there's still snow on the hills around us. And I mean, it, that that's how far north it was. And the water was cold. You were down in the river, and it was warm, and the bugs were out, but the water was ice cold. There's brook trout everywhere, and big, big Atlantic salmon. I mean, we're taught, and what's cool, Mark, the water's gin clear. A lot of the rivers in Labrador, they get that tea color from the uh, tannic in the soil. And here, this river, for some reason, uh, the way where it comes from and the way it flows through the, through the, um, it's kind of like a freestone river. It it's gin clear. You can a lot of times we can sight, uh, we can see the fish and sight fish to them. And we're talking. 10, 15, I hooked into a legitimate 25 pound Atlantic salmon. It didn't stay on long, but I hooked them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyways, and I had a fantastic guy. He actually just came in. I saw him uh, on our feed here a second ago, uh, Chris Sinclair, who actually comes from beautiful Nova Scotia. And Chris is probably one of the uh, best guides I've ever been with. And that'll be talked about in the show. Uh, he's not only does he know his stuff, but uh, a really cool personality and the only man I've ever seen uh, eat a mayfly off a rock. So <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do is just show a little promo from the, uh, the show. And, and it's kind of like an overview of Labrador. And um, when we come back from the video, I'll explain a couple of the points I brought up in this, in this video talking about the, this part of Canada that is so unique. Uh, for a number of different reasons. So first, let me show you Flowers River. For 20 years, I've had the distinct pleasure of hosting and producing the new Fly Fisher. In those years, I've visited some truly amazing places, but there's one destination that stands out, an incredible land that calls me back year after year. That place, Labrador, known as the Big Land. It's 113,000 square miles of untamed and unspoiled wilderness.
each visit, I feel my body, my mind, and my soul are replenished and renewed. It is a supernatural land. This pristine, rugged, and unforgiving land is home to some of the best fly fishing on the planet. A place where massive brook trout will delicately sip a dry fly off the surface or viciously hammer a mouse pattern. Truly wondrous, a thing of angling dreams. But on this trip, my focus is on a species I genuinely adore and respect. Atlantic Salmon. The Atlantic Salmon is a defining element of Labrador, representing the very essence of her wild, free-flowing rivers. To watch an Atlantic Salmon savagely swirl behind a rippling wet fly, or rise with purpose to a dry fly, are among the most exciting experiences in all of fly fishing. Majestic and powerful silver leapers, they captivate, excite, and frustrate, which is all part of their appeal. On this trip to Labrador, I'm returning to a river that I haven't fished in over 14 years. A river that is considered by many hardcore, world-traveling salmon anglers as one of the top waters to cast a fly for the king of game fish. Welcome to Flowers River. Come join me on my adventure to a destination where fly fishing dreams become a reality. Wow. <laughs> you did have a good summer. Yeah. So the, the, the cool thing I want to point out to people about Labrador that's unique is we said 113,000 square miles of pristine wilderness and less than 30,000 people live in Labrador. So we're talking about a place that's just slightly smaller than Alaska, but Alaska has 750,000 people living in it. This place has got less than 30,000 people in it. So it's pretty untouched. You go in some of these rivers, you're you're like the guys are taking me up. Oh, we've never gone up this stream before. And you're casting. It could be a four pound brook trout or it could be a 10 pound Atlantic salmon like you saw in the video before. So I love about the place. It's really cool. There are a few bugs there. They can be almost of biblical proportions at times. But that's why you bring you wear a buff like you saw me wearing all the time. You're using uh, a little bit of spray uh, and, you know, we talk about it in the show and certainly I can answer questions for people in the future if they want, if they're going to go to Labrador and looking to what to wear, what to bring and stuff like that. Cause the weather extremes are really incredible. Like I was there, I remember first week of August, Mark, and I know you've been there, but, and it's beautiful. It's like 80 degrees and then poof, two hours later and it's snowing like mm -hmm. in August. So that's the beauty and the wonder of Labrador the extremes, but I don't know. Not too many places you can catch five, six pound brook trout on dry flies and you get you get bored because you're trying to get the eight, nine pounders or the Atlantic salmon, which are just- That's a good problem to have. I know, watching them come up and eat a bomber. Wow, anyways. And you can't complain about a place that has a population of caribou higher than the population of humans. Yeah, that's- uh, in fact, I think I stated that in one of my shows a few years ago. There's more black bears in Labrador than there is people. So that's a pretty cool place. So we're getting a lot of nice comments here. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, just if I can just quickly address a few of them. Um, we're hoping to go back to Ganglers. In fact, they invited us to come this year, but uh, we couldn't get into Manitoba this year. Um, and gents, we want to go with Joe Humphreys. He was supposed to come pike fishing with me in northern Ontario. And, but we couldn't get them into Canada uh, because of the restrictions. And we are planning to do more shows on stripers and other species and redfish. I mean, we've we got lots of interest. Tom and I were supposed to go and do a show in Louisiana for redfish, but unfortunately it didn't work out because of the pandemic. 
But the good news is there's hope in the future. There's going to be new protocols. There's all these things that are going to make 2021 a much better year for us all to go fishing. And uh, anyways, so Mark, let's talk about the next place you went out in the Western USA. Where would you like to go next? Let's go to Montana. There's a little town um, in Montana called Fort Smith. And if you've ever had um, a vision of what Trout Town would actually look like, Fort Smith is it. There is, um, a, it's, it's a very small town. Uh, there's no main street. Um, people live in uh, trailers for the most part, nice trailers. Um, people are there for the fish. Uh, you have access to the Bighorn River and Bighorn Lake, amongst others. What's funny about this town is that there aren't any restaurants, but there's three fly shops. <laughs> so that, tell, that tells you where the priority is. I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to fish with a gentleman by the name of Pete Shanafeld, who is a co-owner at the Bighorn Angler. Um, and their tagline is where the legend began. And, you know, Pete is one of the fishiest guys I've ever had the pleasure to fish with. Uh, he knows that river intimately. He knows uh, the fish intimately. He knows the seasons. Um, we were hoping to be able to fish hoppers there, um, but it, you know, that with the warm weather and the dry weather, uh, those hoppers never really, really came to a peak. And um, it sort of just, the hopper population just crashed, which was fine. So we were fishing uh, dries and droppers. And um, I was able to lock horns and land a fish in Montana, a uh, brown trout that is uh, the biggest brown trout I've ever had the pleasure of releasing. It was an absolute giant, giant brown. I love big brown trout. Let's play the video. There's some fish in here. There's a couple. Here's the fun part, trying to land them. Got them on the reel, oh. Jeez. Pretty violent. Yeah, pretty violent. <laughs> what a fishery though, man. Pete added a some more tungsten putty to get down a little faster not come up and uh that helped two two drifts two fish lost the first one we'll see if we can get the second one to hand oh that's a giant yeah <laughs> dude i think <laughs> I, I, you're surprised it's bigger than i thought it was <laughs> oh my god let's take a look at this dude this is the fish this is a big brown dude Oh, dude, <laughs> biggest brown trout of my life. Are you serious? You say that every time. <laughs> I don't. How do you like that, huh? How do you like that 22 inch brown trout on a pheasant tail waiting in Montana? Just perfect. <laughs> that was a yeah. hog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The cool thing about fishing with Pete is that, you know, I. There's all kinds of different techniques and, and things that he uses and, and, and fishing with tungsten putty was one that I had never had the experience, have been able to, to fish with before. Have you have you ever fished with tungsten putty, Colin? No, I no, I have not, not the tungsten putty. So what's interesting about that is that it, it, it allows you to have a straight shot tapered leader um, without any, any knots if, if you need to tie tip it on. Um, it allows you a straight shot tip it, uh, or um, tapered leader such that you can manipulate that putty anywhere on the leader without having to uncramp or un undo a split shot or, or what have you. And you can move it. You can stretch it out so that it, it, it covers more of your leader. So it doesn't, it's not as, um, uh, what you call it, when it's not, it doesn't, grab water as well as, as, as a big piece of shot does or something like that. So you get a much more natural drift and, um, that, that big brown ate, ate, ate that pheasant tail and it was lights out. But what was cool about that trip 
is we, you saw a shot of, uh, from the air of those browns that were eating those, those PMDs. Uh, Pete's a very technical angler and he's very forward thinking in his fly selection. So we were throwing all these modern fly patterns at him and at, at these fish and it was crazy and, and we couldn't get one to turn. We fished, we fished those two fish for quite a while. Um, and all of a sudden he says, you know what, let's just try something old. So we threw on a wolf, an old wolf, like an, one of the oldest patterns in the world. And first cast, this thing came up and ate it. And it was lights out. And it was a, that was a great fish. And then, and then another, um, another uh, bend, we found another pot of fish feeding. And we threw all these technical flies at them. And they wouldn't eat. Uh, so we tied on a quill gordon, which is maybe the second oldest fly in the history of fly fishing. And, and, and that was the, the fly that did the trick. So the message here is don't discount those old tried and true patterns that you know, your grandfather's grandfather was fishing with, you know, consider having those as a backup to, to all these technically crazy flies that we have going on today. Well, that's very cool. And Montana is a beautiful place. Uh, I haven't been there for a few years, but um, I guess the last time I went was with you when we went to Missoula for the guide mm -hmm. rendezvous, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump to the next location. Uh, and we went to a lot of places uh, uh, despite all the restrictions. I mean, all things considered, we did really well. Um, we're not going to be able to show tonight some of the great places that you went in, in Ontario this summer, uh, as well as Jenna and uh, Bill. Um, we weren't able to talk about Saskatchewan because we, you know, Phil Raleigh did some shows for us on Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. um, you were supposed to be going to Pennsylvania, Maine, upstate New York. And we were hopefully going to Wisconsin as well to do the drift list. So for, you know, we're, we're hoping next year all these places will work out. And, uh, and we're really excited about going back to Idaho uh, to do some more and some of the other parts of the American West. But this video clip is from a place way, way back when I first started uh, the show. I was really excited to go to the first time. And it's still a place I love to go. And that is Calgary, Alberta, mm -hmm. with the Bow River running right through town. So you're literally you can you can book a hotel there and walk down to the river and nymph for rainbows and browns. And my daughter went with Bill and did some fishing, and they went out with Fishtails Fly Shop, which is exactly the same place I went out with 20 years ago, and with the same guy. Terry. Terry's been there for a long, long time. Uh, again, one of the top guides I've ever met. Uh, Terry Johnson, he's just so personable and he knows his stuff, knows that river and what a great fishery uh, because of the fact, especially it's not above Calgary on the bow. It's got some fishing up there, but below the, the, the city, it's got really, really good fishing. So let me play this clip. And Jenna's with Nancy from uh, Fishtails Fly Shop, who is uh, the owner with her husband, Dave. And they're out on the bow with Terry uh, going down. This is downriver from the actual city. They did fish in the city as well. But this is a little clip from them doing a little fishing. Have a look. That's a fish, little guy. Yep, so just strip him in. Nancy's gonna get your line out of the way. Yep, just keep stripping, just like that. We'll get him off real quick, get Yay. him back in there. Awesome. Yes, this is the future. Yay. There's lots oh, of those. Oh, I see how that works, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah, it just goes down to the bend of the hook and fish pulls himself off. Uh, Yay! Nice okay, fish. okay, okay. Let's yeah. see. Oh, Woo. nice fish. Yeah. So should I be trying to get it on the no, reel? No, no. Just keep that rod high and bent. Okay. Just wear them out a little bit. Okay. Keep that tip nice and high. That's what you want to fight them with, the tip and not the butt. Okay. Fight Good. With the so tip. strip, strip, strip. 
Yep, okay. strip, strip. Keep that rod up though. Keep that tip up. up. There you go. Good, good. And there then you just go. slide them over to me. Woo! Good job. <laughs> this is a nice, look, nice cows. rainbow. Forget the cows. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> cows. Nice and easy. Rod tip up. Rod tip up. Gotcha. Okay. And at the end here, when I scoop for him, if he takes off, you can just let him go. That's it. Okay. One more time. Okay. Strip it right up to the right indicator. Right up to the indicator. Gotcha. And then slide them over. Okay. Up. Ooh. Strip it more. More and more. Strip, strip, strip. strip. That's okay. it. Once he kind of gets on the surface like that, you can water ski him right in Woo! to the net. Nice fish. Another pretty that rainbow on the bow. Gorgeous. Yep. He's about 18. Off you go. Well done. Nice. Right in that Thank little scene there. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, we're doing Boop. this now. You can always tell a fantastic guide by their demeanor when you're hooked up. That guy was calm, cool, collected. What a fantastic, like you can, you, he's been around the block a couple times. Yeah, I like his, uh, the name of his boat too, The Office. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Wow. Uh, we're getting lots of great recommendations there. Uh, Bishop, Cal that. Bishop California. I've got family uh, that lives just outside of Sacramento, and they, there's some nice trout streams up there, uh, Eureka and the whole region in Northern California, and I'd love to go fish there. But uh, so let's let's but we got to keep this moving because we got a lot of places we want to talk about. But uh, Mark, why don't you tell us about your next destination, which I think is in beautiful Wyoming? It is. Um, I fall in, in love with the American West. And uh, for good reason, um, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming are are my my new favorite places to to play in in the West. And uh, I've got a great we've got a great friend uh, out of the Ugly Bug Fly Shop uh, in Casper, Wyoming, by the name of Blake Jackson. And we've been fishing with Blake now for a number of years. Uh, and Blake is just one of those guys that is all in, no matter what. Um, and it shows in. You know, I was just talking about the office and and that guide's personality and how how that that how how great that guide seems to be. And Blake's exactly the same way. He's calm, he's cool and collected. And I was able to fish with him two days before uh, antelope archery season opened. Uh, and then he he had bigger better priorities and he went he he stuck a a, a trophy antelope uh, with a bow. Um, so I forgive him for leaving me with with his head, head guide named Ty Halleck. <clears throat> Pardon me. And Ty has become a great friend over the years. Uh, he's an educator. Um, he fishes the North Platte uh, intimately. Uh, he's he's a guy that likes to hunt big fish. Um, he he asks you right away, do you want a numbers game or do you want to go hunting unicorns? And we decided uh, that we had a day together on this recent trip to um, to Casper. I fished with with Forrest Luton with Addy Dees, um, with Blake Jackson, and with Ty Halleck on this trip. And our last day was with Ty, and we decided to go unicorn hunting, which means we were throwing big streamers for big browns and big rainbows, and we got lucky. So this is streamer fishing. Oh, that's a donkey. This is streamer fishing. Fishing for unicorns. It's a low percentage game, but if you can hook up, chances are they're gonna be good. And this one is big rainbow. Now Ty's got a little fly called a red-headed stepchild on here. And we've got a crawdad trailer on it. it looks like he took the top fly oh that's a big fish man that's a really good fish and that's the thing about you know fishing these streamers here on the north platte is you really are trophy hunting and this i can 
absolutely say is the biggest rainbow of the trip. Nice. Wow, unbelievable. So if you put in your time, throw a ton of streamers, a ton of casts, you'll be duly rewarded. Let's take a look at this guy. You can't even get your hands on him. I can't even get him. my hand around him. <laughs> How do you like that? Oh my heavens, what a giant. What an absolute giant rainbow. Good fish. Stud. Rainbow trout. See you, buddy. Ty. Nice, dude. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. So, streamer fishing on the North Platte. Put in your time, and you will win. I won. Yeah, that was sweet. I love the mullet you have, too. Yeah, the COVID era, right? The <laughs> <laughs> COVID era is an evil thing. Um, yeah, so if you, if, you, if you look closely at that fish, that fish had a clipped dorsal fin, uh, which means that it actually came from a hatchery. And on the North Platte, there are some hatchery fish um, that, are in this, <clears throat> that are in the system. And I asked Ty about that afterwards. And he said, yeah, it's fine that you caught a hatchery fish. It doesn't mean that it's not currently wild. I said, what are you talking about? He said, that fish escaped from the hatchery when it was this big, right? After it had been clipped. That, Cause that's generally when they get released back in, it got it escaped. So it has grown naturally that big and that wild. Now, one of the things I do want to bring to the attention of, of our viewers is <clears throat> being a fishing guide is a tough job. Uh, and being a professional 365 fishing guide is even harder. And Ty Halleck is one of the best fishing guides I've ever fished with, number one. Number two, when he's not guiding, he's an artist. And he has a very unique way of doing his art. And I'll show it to you here. Okay. So as you can see, this is a brook trout fly box that Colin bought me two years ago as a thank you gift for whatever I do, whatever. And <laughs> what's, what's interesting about this... That sounded weird. <laughs> yeah, I know, whatever, you know what I mean. What in, what's interesting about this, this fly box is that Ty actually does his art with Sharpies. All of his artwork is done with Sharpies. So you need to check him out on his website and see some of the most amazing release uh, art that he does for for his clients uh, as a Christmas present or as a as a commissioned work, it's absolutely fantastic. And he'll do Yeti coolers. He'll do he'll do anything. He'll he'll do cups. You know, it's it's great work. Actually, uh, Mark, that's a good point. Is didn't you shoot at his studio? We did. We should make a video. Still to be edited. Yeah, I was going to say maybe that's uh, maybe we could do a guide tips the artist. Yep. Love it. Show him on the river and show his uh, artwork because uh, Ty is a very, he's one of the great guys that you, you and I have had the pleasure of meeting, but he's also a very funny man. Very funny. Uh, every time I see him, he makes me laugh. He's got one of those unique dry senses of humor, uh, very uh, unique to uh, guides who spend a yep. lot of time on rivers and they just deadpan you know, pumping them out. So um, we covered a lot of ground tonight and uh, we've talked about a lot of places. Hopefully everybody, you've enjoyed what we've done tonight and uh, in the future, if you want, between now and when the season starts uh, on the 26th of December, we can do some more of these and talk about and show clips from future shows. Um, you know, the key is let Mark and I know, what, what do you want? What do you want to see? What, are, what do you want to see? Because what, what our plan is for these Wednesday nights, and I got to give you a heads up, sometimes it won't be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They're going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because we're going to be doing some, like we have Phil Rowley on, and a lot of the fly fishers who love still water fishing mm -hmm. are in the West, in Canada and the United States. So we're going to try and make sure that audience gets a chance to see these videos and have discussion with Phil. But I think the key is we want to hear from you. What do you want us to do? How, you know, we're going to bring on guides, lodge operators. Um, we're going to bring on authors. We're going to bring Tom Rosenbauer is going to come on. So who do you want to see? Celebrities. Like, who do you want us to bring on who you can ask questions, who we can talk about their books, about specifics about fly fishing? 
Um, we had really great feedback when uh, we did the Euro Nymphine one with George Daniel. Uh, tell us what you want. I mean, that's the purpose of these Wednesday nights is not just because, you know, some people were like, well, we started this because of the pandemic, but people love them so much. And especially, uh, Mark, you can attest to this when we look at the numbers. There's a lot of people looking right now, but it's amazing how many people watch these later yeah. on YouTube and Facebook. So let us know what you want to see, because I know a lot of you watch them later. Tell us how can we make them better, just like our shows. How can we make them better? How can we make our YouTube channel better? We love feedback. You know, we might not necessarily agree with it, but we're going to do our best to try and, you know, appease everybody. Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know, um, you can always reach me on my, <clears throat> uh, through a personal message on Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm more than willing to engage in conversation with, with anybody about, about fly fishing anytime um, when I'm not slammed. Uh, I love it. Uh, and, and also on Instagram. We're, we're very approachable on, on our Instagram account as well. Um, so don't be shy. Reach out. It doesn't hurt. We're all fly fishermen. We can all benefit from each other for sure. So the last thing, uh, Mark, I think we should say before we close is you, some of you may have seen uh, yeah, through the mid-current post today, through mm -hmm. Facebook, et cetera, and I think uh, it's going to be in some other places over the next week, that we have collaborated with uh, Dave and Amelia Jensen and mm -hmm. Tim and Joan Flagler from Tight Lines. And the reason why we're doing this collaboration is we just realized that the three of us, not only did we work with Orvis, but more importantly, we all had different strengths to bring to the table. And we thought, what better way than for us to collaborate and share each other's videos, promote each other. So like Tim and Joan, I mean, Tim does these fantastic flies and I like the way he breaks it down and makes it very easy for people like me even though I've been time flies for 20 years, mine, mine still look like roadkill unless I get some good instruction. Um, and then on the other side, the Jensen's are really great with their instructional videos, whether it's small streams, dry fly presentations, you know, all the things that they're doing in their YouTube channel. It's all fantastic. And uh, we're hoping that this coming year that, you know, as things ease with the pandemic, that we're going to be able to have them in our show and in our videos. I'm, I'm I've already told Tim I want to bring him to Labrador and yeah, we're going to go catch big brook trout, but then we're going to sit with Tim and tie flies and show the patterns that we're using to catch those big brook trout, whether it's the Moorish mouse or it's a dry fly that's specific to what we're using at that day. Same thing with the Jensen's. We're going to go back and forth. So we're really excited about this collaboration and moving forward uh, over the next few years to build on it and strengthen one another from, you know, the fact that everyone, has their thing that they like. And you know, the big the big advantage for everyone here watching this is that you're gonna get a lot more content this way. And when yeah. we put up a video, Mark, and we do a bass show for the sake of words on small enough bass, Tim's gonna tie the fly that we're gonna use. So people see this pattern, say it's Taps Bug, which is a famous uh, deer hair pattern from Maine. And when Tappany invited, uh, invented, excuse me, and there's gonna be Tim showing you how to tie that that fly. Or so how So how cool is it? Colin, that you can yeah. you can see a fly being tied. Yep. You can see through tight line. You can see the the slow motion technical how to fish it through the Jensen's, and then you can see it put in action in destinations and education through the new fly fisher. We cover the entire gamut as a group, and fly fishers benefit all over the world. Okay. I think that's great. That, that's you've said it very well. And uh, I've already seen some comments over on the right here side here and. Uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're hoping to have Brian Chan back on the show. Uh, he's been really busy as of late. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to go to BC for a number of reasons to go shoot with him. And uh, we, I'm glad to hear some of you already going to Tim's videos. That's great. And we're going to work with them, try, as I said, coordinate on some of the flies that they match to the shows we're doing. And then, of course, the last thing is that uh, uh, men... Manuel is asking about uh, how the shows are made. You don't want to know. It's not pretty. It's like the law. You don't want to see how the law is made. It's 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 <laughs> like making sausages. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, you know, that's a good point. Maybe we could show people the amount of effort that goes into making a show, like the one you just put up there in Idaho, 
where or the one that's coming up this weekend because yeah. I don't think people would realize, would recognize that show that you did with Lonnie and Doug at Three Rivers uh, uh, Ranch in uh, Yellowstone Teton. That was 10 plus days of editing. Mm -hmm. Not to mention how many days were there shooting. So you had five days in the field shooting. Yeah. Then you came back. You probably spent, what, two, three days shot listing. And two days that. scripting. Two yeah, or three scripting. This is right? a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Because we were, we were months in this show. Yeah. And that's that's the truth. That's one of the reasons why we didn't put it in last season. We actually shot it over a year ago. And it took Mark that long to put it together. But even our average shows, uh, I think logistically, it's a our average show is five shooting days average plus a travel date in front and back. Uh, then we have the shot listing, scripting, outputting, editing. It's it's amazing. Uh, I know some shows are made in four days, and we're not one of those. We're we're averaging two to three weeks. On average, yeah, at least. And, and people, people always say, "Oh, you, you're, you're a fishing show host. That's that's the dream job everybody could have. The fishing is the reward, and fishing is literally about ten percent of what this what this job really is. When it comes to business development, when it comes to dealing with uh, with sponsors and public and and shows and appearances and and editing and but it's it's awesome." It is awesome. A lot of work, a lot of work. And we should mention here, um, and something we haven't done, two things. One is that if it, you had any, uh, if you wanted to know, there's 12 people involved in the show. Mm -hmm. There's you and I, Mark. There's 10 other people behind us that help make this show possible. They're uh, the court. That, yeah. And, there, and, and to that, I want to mention a, particularly a, a big thank you to our camera men this summer. We don't have any camera women yet, but uh, our cameraman went through a lot to get to some of these locations. Like when you went to Idaho and going through the screening process, we had to get um, COVID testing. We had to go in isolation after we came back uh, and they had to do, I mean, mm -hmm. one of our cameramen, his mother, he's living you know, at home. He's, he's fairly young and his, I mean, he's in his early twenties mm -hmm. and his mother, unfortunately has been having some health issues and, he had to spend his two weeks in an Airbnb, right? Isolated for two weeks because yeah. yeah. he didn't want to come home and take the chance he'd give it to his mom. So uh, big kudos to our camera people who put up with a lot and especially to uh, Brett, Brett Kulpitz who put up with a month with me in, in Labrador. Not just the bugs, me, grumpy me. He didn't like me in the morning when I didn't have my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So listen, everybody, thank you very much for joining us this Wednesday night. And uh, next week, we'll keep it a surprise, but uh, you're going to see some great authors, fly fishing celebrities, a whole bunch of people between now and Christmas. And in January, I think you're going to be really happy how we're going to tie who's on Wednesday nights with the shows that are coming on broadcast online and on television on Saturdays. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us, and I hope you're all doing well and looking forward to our friends in the States to Thanksgiving weekend. Coming up, not next weekend, that's next week after, but soon. Take care. Thanks, everybody.